Uh, we can make something up. <laughs> um, uh, let's let's jump into it because I'd imagine most people would now be brought in, and I understand there are uh, people from a host of different nations, in particular India. For some reason, this particular group has a popular, uh, a passionate supporter group in India, and so welcome. Uh, to those of you who have tuned in from India, I'm not sure what time is there, but we appreciate you being here for the final time this year as we do the Primary Club Virtual conversation. This one, the umpire strikes back. These monthly webinars have been, honestly, they've been sensational from a conversation point of view, but we've raised some great money and uh, I can't wait to have this conversation as well. Of course, a huge thank you to our sponsors, as always, Vocus Communications, Australia's leading fiber and network solutions company. Uh, a big shout out uh, as well to those Vocus customers and staff who are here. We always love having you. Ponting Wines, who are the providers of the sponsor's product, um, who have kept us fueled throughout. And we're going to be auctioning off another six pack of Ponting Wines tonight for you to have. Uh, the Entertainment Quarter, if you uh, were lucky enough to be there at our test breakfast, uh, hopefully you got there and you're able to remain COVID free. Uh, we'll definitely be back there next year. And uh, as always, it was a pleasure to see in person uh, the gentleman who has been my co-host for every single one of these, the president of the Primary Club. Good evening, Mr. Maxwell. Hello, Matt. Good evening to you. Hello to everyone who's uh, with us. Well, not against us, but with us, hopefully, for the next hour. But uh, I'm sure there'll be a few people who want to throw a, a stump the ump or something like that in this conversation. But um, it's a very friendly game, cricket. And you always have plenty of time to talk about it, unlike footy games, which blink and they're gone. But cricket, it's like the menu degustation and a good wine. Good evening. <laughs> um, like uh, like the two match referee, Jim. <laughs> did you hear that, Jim? No, I missed that. Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, good. The sledges have started early, don't worry. It was a sledge, was it? <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, nice sure it'll, 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 it'll get very up for lunch break, Jim. <laughs> um, uh, did you suffer COVID, Jim? Did I hear that correctly? Um, yeah, I did have a bit of misfortune in going to Hobart and uh, being told um, as I got ready for the big day night on the Friday that my wife had COVID, so I was considered close contact, and I jumped on a plane and came home in time for the first ball. So I missed the, the test. I'm, I'm feeling fine. As you can see, I've been having my medicine. So uh, I'm, I'm back in a normal form. But uh, I did miss the test match. But, I mean, it was a bit like every other test match in the series, unfortunately. Mm. And, um, yes, three days. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, let's introduce the, the other three individuals that you can see. As, as mentioned, umpire strikes back. And the first time we've done umpires, and I look forward to to this. Um, let's introduce a gentleman who is, I suspect, been fairly regular feature of most people's lounge rooms this summer uh, with that very backdrop. Um, Mr. Simon Torfel, who uh, umpired 74 tests, 174 ODIs, 34 T20s, and voted the ICC umpire of the year on multiple occasions. Just an all round good guy and a little bit of a smart ass. Simon Torfel, hello. <laughs> Hello, Matt. Have you got any free tickets uh, for music events to help my daughter out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know. You just let me know. And anytime you can come and umpire uh, Nova Charity Cricket Games as a trade-off, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no, love. Great to be with you all and um, great to see officiating part of your, your series. It's, um, yeah, it's long overdue and, and uh, we appreciate it. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Uh, Claire Polisak, who... Uh, is currently joining us from Canberra, where she's about to saddle up for the women's ashes, which is underway when rain isn't preventing it. Uh, played in one test, 18 ODIs, 34 T20s, and is now an education officer with the New South Wales Cricket Umpires and Scorers Association. And we really appreciate you joining us this evening. Claire, hello. Hello. No, thank you uh, very much for having me. I'm looking forward to the next little bit of time and to see what, what comes out of it, I guess. So thank you very much. Oh, not at all. How is our, our nation's capital? Tell me this one's not going to rain out. It, it's not raining at the moment, um, but I reckon weather is very much black magic. So we'll see what happens. You can't Great. control the future, that's for sure. Great. Uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll hear from you guys what we're going to be auctioning. Uh, but uh, also, this is a real pleasure. As a member of the ICC elite panel of umpires, umpired 75 tests, 85 ODIs, 43 T20s, and an all-round uh, phenomenal. Uh, umpire. Rod Tucker, thank you so much for joining us. 
Cheers, Matt. Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, as you can see, I've gone to a lot of preparation to mm. get my memorabilia in the background. Yep. Um, so I'm looking forward to some interesting questions and some repartee with Mr. Taufel and Mr. Maxwell. Be good fun. <laughs> Is, it, uh, is Simon known for being the one that hoards every piece of cricketing memorabilia? Because he seems to have taken it from the two of you. Uh, I've just probably never bothered. <laughs> really? Never? No, I don't. I just... Well, I, I used to get it, grab some when I played, but it just sits in a box and I never did anything with it. And actually, similar to this, one time I was um, talking to my wife and I was, I'd had some old stuff stuck on the wall behind her. And I thought, oh, and no disrespect, Simon. I don't mean this in, in, in any way. Oh, but I just looked at the, at, the, at the background and went, no, I don't want that. So I just <laughs> told her to take it off the wall. And yeah, there's, there's the, the backdrop. How good. Um, well, we have uh, the same format as always. We have a couple of auction items. We have the opportunity for you to ask some questions uh, and interact with these guys already, as mentioned, uh, a couple of people. Tuning in from Rohit is uh, in Italy. He's uh, excited to meet Simon and Rod Wall. Uh, Harsha, I love the background at Simon's Ends. Greeting from India. Chris, hello from the UK. So hello to everyone. Uh, thank you so much. And we are here for a good cause, Jim. The money we've raised for the primary club is through these things has been unreal. Tens of thousands of dollars. For those who haven't seen any of these, what is the money that we're going to be raising here going to? Well, I'm not sure specifically. But can we say that, uh, it depends who's putting their hand up to ask for a, uh, some contribution to a cause. And so that could be anything from saleability, um, special wheelchairs for disabled people to access the beach, um, anything that's happening in a, a school playground to do with uh, helping disabled people have some kind of athletic enjoyment. Um, so there's, a, there's such a variety of things. We don't really put our finger on any one um, idea in particular. Remembering, of course, that the, the history of the primary club in England was a charity for the blind, they used to say, visually impaired to be politically correct these days. So we sort of moved away from that in 1974 when we started the charity in Australia uh, to help those people who are disadvantaged with um, sporting equipment and the like. So uh, I don't think, is there any specific project you're going to throw the $10,000 that um, Simon Torpel's giving tonight? To, to <laughs> we approved $60,000 for those three schools, the new playground equipment. Well, if we sell putters hat, we might get there. <laughs> new playground equipment, that's what you, you donate. You, you, you've got all that stuff there, Simon. Looks it. like you spent the last 10000 on your Christmas pre, Jim. I, I did, yes. And another 10000 on the decorations, don't worry. That's what it's going to cost someone to pull it down too. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's as, why it stays there for six months. Yeah, as, as Mark uh, has already commented, only 333 days till Christmas, Jim. You've gotten in nice and early. 333? Just, just 333. All right, I'll have to look and see if there's anything under the tree, but um, I've got it in my glass at the moment. Anyway, look, we... Uh, we're all going here, there, and everywhere at the moment. Yes, let's 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 uh, focus. That's up. the nature. That's the nature of almost every cricket discussion on and off the air you ever have. Yes. Yeah. And and uh, on the back end, oh, Roger, put your hand up. Is that intentional, or are you just? Oh, I'd love, I'm sorry. Uh, that was to <laughs> remark about the Christmas tree. Oh, it's just simply pies. I think you, you you've been. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most polite thing that has happened in the history of this series. Thank you for respecting Zoom uh, Zoom etiquette. <laughs> just chime in um, all right let's let's figure out how we're going to raise some money today as is usually the case you use the chat feature to make your bids you use the q a feature to write your questions as people have already started doing uh which we'll ask these guys at the end but claire you are offering up our first auction item this evening what is it yes yeah, so i unfortunately i don't have it physically with me it's it's uh at home but it's a field shirt that I wore in the 2018 Women's T20 World Cup in the West Indies. So I do have a photo of it, uh, of, it on, of me wearing it. Uh, thank you to oh, Google. Awesome. Um, so it is uh, from the 2018 World Cup uh, that was held in the West Indies, the first time that the Women's World T20 had been uh, held 
uh, standalone, which was really exciting. Yeah, great. Oh, well, that's absolutely brilliant. And that uh, bidding is opening right now as well for both uh, Claire and Simon's. We've got three bottles of Ponting Wines as well, our sponsor. And so people know what else we've got. Simon, what are you going to throw up for the back half? Well, because of the international flavour of, um, of our attendees, I've pulled out a, a brand new international turf white cricket ball that was used in the um, Warren Tendulka All-Star Series 2015, where we had three matches, LA, New York and Houston. Um, so it's an international quality ball worth about 160 bucks on its own. It's been signed by the four chiefs, uh, sorry, umpires, Steve Davis, myself, Maria Rasmus, who's just been named as ICC umpire of the year for the third time, and Samir Bandekar. And uh, yeah, it was used, well, not used in that series, but it's actually got the emblem or logo of the series on it as well. So uh, I, I challenge anyone to find another one of these in the world. Yeah, amazing. Well, unique. Uh, mm. Yeah, thank you. And thank you both of you for that. The bidding now opens for uh, Claire's shirt from the World Cup and the first three bottles of wine. And there's already a $100 bid. So thank you so much. We'll run that through till 8.30. Uh, and then we'll switch it over to Simon's. But Jim, there is, I mean, you can tell from the questions already, lots of things that people <laughs> want to discuss. But umpiring in the recent world of cricket. So I'll, I'll leave it to you, my friend. Well, I think we'll start with Claire Lady, Ladies first as she's about to be involved in this Ashes test. Hopefully the weather's kind to it over the next four days at, uh, at Monica. But you're not in the, in the front line, Claire. Now, what's happening? Is, is there a pecking order uh, with the umpires that means you, you're the one carrying the, the new ball and the umbrellas in this game? Yeah, no, I, I'm fourth umpire. Um, and you're right, hopefully we will not be needing to carry the umbrellas. But, I mean, every member of the PCT is important. Uh, I've actually been saved as third umpire by a very good fourth umpire. So it doesn't matter what role we've got. Um, I'm looking forward to making sure that the team can perform as well as possible. So if I can look after everything on the, around the peripheral of the field for the guys on field to, to make sure that they can worry about what's in front of them. So I'm looking forward to looking forward to that challenge to make the days run smoothly for them. So, in a nutshell, what is it about umpiring that you like? Why why do you do it? Because it's not not a full time uh, career in your case, like the boys have, have got. Yeah, I think I, I never had the opportunity to play cricket. Um, I, I grew up and there wasn't a lot of girls cricket, and I was too scared to to play with the boys. Um, but it was just something that I, I loved cricket. Um, you know, mum and dad, we drove travel from Goulburn to Sydney every year to watch the Sydney Test match. Um, and it was just part of our life, even though we didn't play it. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to do the umpires course. And when I was about 15 or 16 and haven't really looked back, um, I love the challenge and the fact that you get better every time you step out on the field and the, the great people you meet. I mean, the, I've got friends from all around the world now, which is, which is really lucky and uh, exciting to have. So what's... What's the most lively reaction to a decision you've made on the field that you've had and how did you handle it? Yeah, it, the most lively reaction, it wasn't actually a, a reaction to a decision that I'd made. Uh, it was in lower grades uh, premier cricket in Sydney when the poor fast bowler had about, if, if I said six drop catches during the day, I don't <laughs> think I'm exaggerating. And another one had gone down and he lost his cool uh, very much so. Uh, so all I did was I turned, uh, the captain was at second slip, I think. So I just turned my body and I stared the captain down until he got the message. And then as the captain ran past me to uh, cool down his bowler, he's gone, sorry, Claire, as he's, as he's gone past me. So it was just about keeping cool and allowing, allowing him just to sort out his own player. You've had the chance to do men's and women's cricket. Worst worst uh, reaction in the in the women's game because I strike it that they're fairly polite most of the time is that a misread no I, th I think you you've read that quite well I think that the girls are there the intensity is the same but they're playing the game in the right spirit and so more often than not they'll they'll accept the umpire's decision uh, no matter which member of the team it is very good um, and uh, as far as your role is concerned um, how many how many times a year are you umpiring? Because um, it, it strikes me it's always been an issue with uh, women's cricket until recently that they don't play often enough at the top level. Although that, you know, it is changing, luckily. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there's Premier Cricket, which is every weekend in summer from September to April. So there's lots of cricket there um, with the increase of the WBVL and having more and more women's internationals. There, there's lots of um, cricket opportunities now where there's so much cricket it, around. It, it's really exciting re, um, that, that there's so many opportunities to, to umpire um, no matter what level of cricket you're, you're involved in. All right, we'll bounce around the room. Rod Tucker's there and, and Simon Thorpe. One of the interesting things I've found, found about cricket uh, over the years and the occasional umpiring that I've, I've done in some club cricket, as, as you do when the players are umpires um, and you don't have anyone officially appointed, is the inability of some umpires to count to six. Have you noticed this has been a problem over the years, Simon? The first that you've stood with? Particularly Assad, Assad Ralph, I think, was the most famous one. He was so busy printing himself at square leg that he, he never kept count of the actual number of balls. Yeah, I think Rod might back me up on this, but if you had Assad and Aleem on field and you had Billy in the box, Billy Bowden in the box, I reckon you probably got the three worst counters in international cricket together. So a perfect storm. Yeah. Rod, what do you think? I'm, I'm not prepared to comment. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is that there are six balls in and over. I mean, why would you need a counter? Um, you can't you count six on your fingers? And then if you're not sure, you just ask the bloke at square leg. And I, think I haven't got six fingers, Jim. I've only got five. All oh, right. Okay. Thank you to say Paul Overs are out the door. Yeah, you you, <laughs> you reminded me of an umpire from school who was called the one-arm bandit because he only had one arm and he did struggle for a sixth finger. But <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> Somebody in Queensland who got to 13 and an over, wasn't it? Seriously, why do you need a counter? You only have to count to six. And it's, it's harder, it's harder than you think. Help you. Go on, Claire. It's, it's much harder than you think, especially when there's lots of other things going on and it's 35 degrees and it's 78% humidity. And Jim, have you ever played golf? I've, I've tried many times over a number of years, yes. You ever lost count on the golf course? <laughs> no. <laughs> I know a few that have. No, no, I, I know other people who've lost count and have rectified on the scorecard. But still, uh, you know, that, that's a matter of honesty and etiquette more than anything. <laughs> it is. Well, <laughs> so it's counting out in the field sometimes. I will tell you this if I can, just I'll give you one Billy Bowden story. And it's a very good one from the Ashes in 2005 uh, because we were staying at Dalton Square near the Oval for the last test. And we walked down the ground. And um, this is on day two. And I said, because I know that he's got a slight ego issue. And I said, so how many would you give yourself out of 10 for yesterday, Billy? Four. Seven. And we kept walking a bit, just let that one drop. I said, well, you're actually stuffed up, you know. He said, what are you talking about? I said, you gave Warney a seven ball over. He said, ball. I did not. And we kept walking a bit further. I said, but it's, you're all square. Don't worry about it. It's nothing to worry about at all. Up for the five ball over, eh? <laughs> I said, you gave him a five ball at Edgbaston, so we're all square. <laughs> oh, I had to get one on him. Oh, dear. But what a character. I mean, can you be a character and a good umpire? Because uh, I remember when Steve, um, Billy Bowden first appeared, Steve Moore said, when asked about his uh, eccentricities and showmanship, he said, I don't give a stuff what he does as long as he gets the decisions right. And um, is, is that a problem for some umpires, that they they get a bit concerned with um, maybe how they're looking or what, what what else is going on than concentrating on the game? Who'd like to comment on that? Well, Rob, well, comment, that. Rob, over to you. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to think that the people have come there to watch the cricket and not the um, umpires. True. Uh, if you're there watching umpires, really, then what's wrong with the cricket because all we do is stand out there and and make decisions and count to six and you know I wouldn't have thought we're the highlight of the uh, of the day and if we are then I think you are probably trying to self-promote. Uh, Jim we've um, yeah, Rod's touched on this uh, we've been brought up in a system in New South Wales where that's very much the style you know you should be should be unobtrusive as much as you can but Look, I think uh, it's important to be yourself on the field. 
Um, and to that end, Daryl Harper would describe me as someone with no personality, so I take that at face value. But we've had, you know, Rudy Kutzen, Steve Buckner, Dave Shepard. You know, we've really had some characters in the game. Um, you know, dare I say, Dickie Bird before my time. But, you know, I, I think it's really important that whatever you do, and umpiring is one of those activities, like playing, for example, I think we're seeing a little bit of that character leave the game. You know, it, it's more about the technical, the technique, et cetera. And even the players, you know, the code of conduct has really sort of, you know, squashed a lot of that that humanness out of emotion and and uh, and character out on the field a bit. Um, but yeah, it's having said that, job. Simon, th there's some great characters in the world of umpiring right now, such as you know, um, you know, like how long does it take to get Paul to get to know Paul Rifle? I mean, Paul Rifle. Once you get to know him, he's an incredible character. Steve Davis, that's you know been around for a long time. Bruce Oxenford, um, you know the the Aussies, obviously. Um, you know, but you know you get guys like um, Richard Illingworth, who uh, you know when, once you get to know Richard, uh, you know he's just a a wonderful human. You know, there, there's some great characters, but I don't think. Um, you know, I think sometimes just because people behave in unusual ways on camera like Billy, um, they think that that becomes a great character where um, I don't know that's the actual, the way it really is. How would you describe yourself, sense. right? Sorry? How would you describe yourself? Are you a great character? Am I a great character? Um no, I wouldn't wouldn't have described myself as a great character, but I didn't mention myself in those names either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll stick my hand up and say I think you are. I mean, if you look at your golfing talent, um, if you look at the rapport that you have with the, the players, you know, um, and the way that you're able to, you know, converse and humanise with them and, and have a working relationship, I think that's really at the heart of good character. Yeah. Um, I'll pause you there very briefly and just update you. So... Uh, Claire, that shirt has uh, been very popular. So we're at $300 for the shirt um, with eight minutes remaining. We'll run uh, for the duration of the hour, the box of Ponting Wines. Uh, so the box of six, which is at $150, um, but eight more minutes for Claire's shirt. And then we'll switch to uh, the ball from Simon. Sorry, Jim. Is that okay? Yeah. Now, there'll be lots of questions floating around the room. Um, but now that you're able to do what everyone who started umpiring dreamt of doing, that is to officiate in your own country's test matches, uh, that must be a thrill in itself. And how long is it going to last, Rod? You know. Well, it's interesting you, you say that because in actual fact, if you ask us, it's not a big deal to umpire in your home country. It's it's actually it actually makes things more difficult because you're not neutral. Um, it raises different things that aren't there when you're umpiring overseas. Like uh, you know, particularly with COVID, the way it has been, where we're all in the same hotel and we constantly get put into the Australian team dining room and you constantly get put on their bus and little things like that that the opposition team look at and go well so we've we've got the umpires are in there on their team now in, we're lucky england were fantastic and they there was never a, a drama but it would have been so easy for them to arc up about that or find fault in that does that make sense? Yeah, I didn't realise you were living so close to the Australian team as they were moving around. I would have thought you'd certainly well, be traveling independently to the ground, not with them. Uh, only when we raised it and said, no, we've got to change that. There were situations where it was arranged differently, but the, a lot of the times we had to raise it and say, hey, this isn't right. We can't be eating breakfast in the Australian team room. Uh, our laundry going back to the Australian team room. Things like that that were just 
as I say, it's a lot easier if you're neutral. So, and, uh, Simon, uh, haven't you previously spoken though about uh, the uh, benefit in attracting umpires if they can umpire in their own country? And I would imagine umpiring a Boxing Day test would be the same level of honour as playing in one if you're a top flight umpire. Matt, the challenge that the international game has is that the neutrality policy is different for every format of the game. You know, T20s are all home umpires. Uh, one day is a home and away umpires. And test matches are basically all away umpires. You know, so there's no consistency to that neutrality policy. Um, Rod's right that it is more distracting and it's harder to officiate in your own country because there are just other things that you don't actually get to compartmentalise that you can like when you're overseas. If you're overseas, it's all about the umpiring. If you're at home, you're trying to mix your home duties, your friends, your family together with umpiring. And, and so that's incredibly challenging in its own way. But I think what, what COVID has shown us, we've had 12 umpires, I think, debut over the last 13 months at the international level in test matches. And I think it's fair to say that all of those umpires have really stood up and be counted and performed uh, equally, if not better, than some of the elite panel umpires. So they, they've certainly um, uh, been rewarded and been acknowledged that they were ready for test cricket. Um, and I think in this environment, with even just the Ashes series, you, you've seen the way that uh, Rod and his cohort have performed. There is an argument to probably say, well, neutrality doesn't matter. It does matter in some countries. Like I, I couldn't see an Indian umpire umpiring in Pakistan and vice versa. <laughs> but I think perhaps some consideration could be given to relaxing the prescriptive regulations around neutrality and leaving it uh, for more horses for courses um, and allowing you know, more umpires to officiate uh, in their own country if that you know, keeps more, more people in the game, yeah, for sure, and, and, and to aspire to. Is this COVID era going to change the way umpires are appointed in future? Um, I'm obviously, it's still got a bit of space to run, but just the economics of it seems to me that the ICC probably think it's better to, to have the home umpires doing the job. It will all, it'll all come out in the wash in the next probably six months to 12 months, Jim. Um, they're talking about sending us uh, or getting us to travel again after um, April, May. Um, you know, we've still had uh, umpires going to Bangladesh and places like that. Um, there's, there's talk of, you know, like why can't an Australian umpire and an English umpire umpire an Ashes test? Yeah. Um, I personally, I, I wouldn't want to umpire an Australia versus India test in India. Um, I, I just, you know, I know how passionate Indian fans are about the game, and I wouldn't. I, I just wouldn't want to do that. It just would be, it would be overwhelming if you like um, to do that. And if you made an error that went in Australia's favour, um, you know, it, it just I wouldn't want to be there. And that's no, no disrespect to anyone. That's just, I, I just would rather not put myself in that situation. What's the situation um, with the women's game, Claire, and uh, the way um, umpires are, uh, are going to be um, appointed? And uh, do you have misgivings about any particular place? <laughs> uh, you're up, you, you wouldn't want to umpire? Oh, I guess the, the women's game, just like what Simon said about the different levels of men's cricket, the, the women's game internationally is uh, appointed differently again um, in terms of it's, it's um, all local umpires. So it doesn't matter if it's a women's T20 ODI or test match, it's all a local board appointment, obviously, that gets ratified or agreed to by the ICC, but it comes from home. Um, but everywhere you umpire, um, I mean, it's, it's different umpiring at home. Um, in some respects, it's it's really nice to be able to share it with friends and family, but then you're also conscious that do they have their match day tickets? Do they, are they, do they have a good seat? Are they okay? Whereas when you travel away, um, it's got no, nothing to do with you. You don't need to worry about them. Um, you can just concentrate on what, what you need to do. Um, so I've been really lucky with different opportunities um, and traveling around, but I don't, can't think of anywhere that I wouldn't want to umpire at the moment. Um, they're, they're all good, good in their own way. Um, whilst Claire's there, I'll just say right now, uh, 
fitting clothes and Claire, that shirt just raised four hundred dollars. So thank you. Ah, that is a great thank result. You, yeah. Really, really appreciate it. And Mark Daly, um, we will be coming for you. And so the auction is still open for the wine at one hundred and fifty. And Simon, remind us what we have open now. Just tell us again what we are bidding for from now. Yeah, uh, cricket all stars T Twenty USA. Um, Tendulkas versus um, Warns, and it's a white ball of that series, complete with logo and signed by the four match officials on the other side. Houston, Beautiful. LA, New York. Yeah, great. Thank you. From 2015. Um, I'll ask a question uh, from the Q&A, but it's related to this. It's from David Stewart. He says, doesn't DRS review solve any issues of neutrality? Um, Simon. You're already talking. You can pick, well, you can tell. As long as you've got reviews left, I suppose that's okay. Uh, that's but you still get questions like total total honesty here. In the fifth test, Stuart Broad says to me from mid on, Do you know we haven't had an umpire's call go our way this whole series? Really? Right. And and I went and Steve Smith's batting at the non strikers and he turned around and said to Broady, Stuart, Rod gave me out LBW in Adelaide, um, umpire's call. And he went, oh. Yeah. And I said, and if you think I'm that good that I can decide whether someone's out or not out on an umpire's call, I'll take that as a compliment. That's, but that's a the sort of... Now, isn't it? That is a bowler speaking. Yeah. It is a bowler, but it's, it's those things that you sort of go, well, you just don't need that, Jim. You know, no. uh, it's just... It just does DR make you a better or a lazier umpire? Uh, it certainly doesn't make us lazier. Um, we well, still you've got have insurance, to make a decision. Insurance, you know. Yeah, but we still have to make a decision either way. Um, yeah. And yeah. and we get our our pay packet every month on whether or not we get it right. So it 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 doesn't make it any easier. It actually, what we do have to do is stand there in front of millions of people doing this. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? What happens when you come back and see your mates? What are they first thing they do? Oh, I saw that decision where you had to change it over. I was I was going to ask, and this is my own question, so I'll just I'll jump I'll change the format because every time an umpire has to reverse a decision, I watch them, and it just looks like a little bit of their soul is dying, knowing that this is happening on camera. Is that the case, or do you go, oh, okay, business business as usual, play? I'm glad we've corrected it, or you go, you mother, I'm certain that was right. Matt, when was the last mistake you made at work? Oh, I've made mistakes during this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next time you make it, you've got to stand up, do that in front of all of us. So how many viewers we got now? Yep, yep, and, hundreds. And yeah, and and that's what it's like. I mean, none of us like making errors, but it's part of the game now. You know, that's what we have to do. Um, and you move on pretty well, pretty quickly. Um, you know, some guys hold on to it a bit longer. Other guys move on okay. And then like with everything, at least now we've got enough footage of everything to try and learn from those mistakes. And that's what we try and do, yeah. I was amazed when they had, um, it was one of your segments, Simon, I think there was a rain delay and they were just going deep dive on umpire DRS success rates, that the success rate of an umpire's decision is 93%. And then with DRS, it's 98%. Firstly, 93% is a great number. Secondly, 98% is a terrible number. Well, if you'd asked any coach, any player before a match started and said, would you be happy with nine out of 10 right? They'd all probably yeah. put their hand up and say, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Jim Maxwell standing at the end. Yeah, I'll take nine out of 10 from Jim. No problem. Um, but of course, they only worry about the ones like Stuart Broad's articulated through Rod. They only worry about the ones that go against them. And that's why we're saying, you know, pre this session starting tonight, that people want consistency, but they don't want it all the time. And they only want it when it goes in their favour. Um, and look, DRS on average improves the decision percentage by about five in, in rough terms. But then sometimes they don't use the DRS or sometimes they've run out of reviews. So one thing we know about technology is it's not perfect. You know, when was the last time your mobile phone played up? When was the last time your computer didn't reboot or start up? You know, technology has failures within itself. Um, and so while we would never want technology to replace the umpires, there is a mechanism there to support them um, for when, you know, things don't go well. And we've all been there, um, myself, Claire and Rod, and anyone that's picked up an umpire encounter and tried to count to six, we all make mistakes. It's just that the best in the world make the fewest amount. 
there. You had you had something to throw in there. Yeah, I was just in in some respects, umpiring club cricket on a Saturday is harder than umpiring for me an international match because at least in a, you know right or wrong, you've got the decision and you've got clarity and and closure whether or not it was correct or not. And then in in club cricket on a Saturday, um, it, you might have made an absolute best decision that you've ever made. But because, as Simon said, the decision went against a team, they may not like it. Um, and, and you have to have to deal with it that way. And there's no video evidence to, to, to support you or to, to help you learn from it. So it's, it's different. That's all, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So how hard is it? And I've spoken to Jeff about this. When you know, instant after you've made the decision, they said, oh, Jesus, I got that wrong. To get it out of your head so that, Within the next five minutes, something comes up and you're not distracted, lose concentration and stuff it up again. So how do you manage that? Yeah, that is the worst thing you can possibly do, isn't it? To, to hold on to it, um, because if your mind is still thinking uh, what happened before, then you're not focused on the present. And I guess everybody will have different strategies and it's about picking one that works for you. For me, it's writing it down on my note card at the, at the next possible opportunity, which sometimes may not be till the end of the next over. Um, so I've just got to do my best to get it out of my head and then um, write it down uh, when I'm at square leg next. The other thing about the, the DRS, of course, is it's given players more power to an extent to make calls, even though it's not the final judgment. Um, can we get away from having reviews at all or, or is this just uh, for the betterment of the game? Is the only way to manage the process, Simon? of getting the decisions right is to allow the players uh, to refer decisions. Well, Jim, I think statistically we can prove that the players are not umpires. They only get it right roughly about 25% of the time when they do True. go for a review. Yeah. Um, so we know that they're not ideally placed um, to be umpires. Um, I, I, like, I like the fact that the umpires make decisions. I, I think that that's primarily what should happen. Um, I think we'll move towards getting rid of the obvious mistake, towards getting more decisions correct, whatever that means. I, I think that um, the game will continue to evolve and at some point, cricket committee will discuss, you know, should we get rid of umpire's call? Any ball clipping the stumps is out, regardless of predictive path accuracy or not. Um, so I, I can see the game will be driven by those stakeholders who sit around that table and say, what do we want our game to look like? And we'll still have the same questions, the same debate about whether that's right or wrong. Um, so it really doesn't matter what the umpires think or what they like. For me, I'd still like to maintain the integrity of umpires making decisions. And as Rod said before, you know, uh, with DRS there or not, th their decisions count, they mean something. A and what happens if we leave it to technology and the umpire doesn't make a decision, and sorry, Snicko is not available, hotspot's not available, ball tracking is not available for this decision, what happens then? You know, so I think we've got to start from a position of integrity in the game and the umpire is doing what they're trained to do. Yeah, there's a comment. I think we had two it. hours of that in um, Brisbane. In the Brisbane test, we had two hours where the TV cup, the generator broke mm. at the Gabba or blew up. And we actually had no technology for two hours. Uh, the, uh, I think there was no broadcast for about 45 yeah, minutes. Yeah, it was It was like the old 19, what, 50, 40, 30s or whatever. There was just one no, camera. No, be very careful like, here, boys. Jim, you remember that? <laughs> I'll have to short, shorten you up. There was a broadcast because we had two commentators at the ground and we were able to do a ball-by-ball -ball commentary from the ground, even though most of our team was in a studio in Sydney calling it off June, but we had nothing to look at. But uh, right, okay. yeah. that's where you need to. But uh, as it turned out, there weren't, weren't too many controversial moments in that period, were there, right? Um, a, might have been a couple of no balls that I missed. <laughs> Do you even look now at the no ball? Do you even look down? Well, well we don't. No. When the, when the no ball technology is working. Yeah. yeah. But in that situation, um, it wasn't. And we were trying to call them. <laughs> and unfortunately, we had one of the most difficult bowlers in the world to actually see their front foot and Ben Stokes. And um, so that, uh, I believe, well, I know I missed one, I think one ball. And then he might have been very tight on a couple of others and then he got a wicket. 
So it became a bit of a controversy, but, um, you know, that's, that's life. As an update on the auction, by the way, the, uh, the ball is currently at $300 uh, with Luke and the wines are currently at $200 with Mark, but still 20 minutes uh, to go on that. Was there, was there the only howler of the entire Ashes, I think, was the Paul Rifle, the ball that hit the stumps that didn't knock off the bales that was given out caught behind or whatnot. Like, that is the only instance where you go, thank God there was a video because that would have been a really difficult one for everyone to have to deal with. But otherwise, did not DRS just make every great moment a bit awkward for three or four minutes whilst we go through the process and then just create more debate anyway? Oh, look, I, I think that's one of the reasons that, um, you know, DRS works for the game is that the game goes on the way it should have. And, you know, in the past, that's not always been the case. So, um you know, unfortunately, that morning, the day before in the, the game in Sydney, I'd asked the fourth umpire to fix up the stumps because they were too wobbly. So he got some water yeah. and some mud and fixed them up and they were that tight in the ground that obviously the, the ball had the stumps <laughs> and the bales didn't come off. Cement, mate. So it was actually my fault. Yeah. So I'll take the blame for that. Yeah. And Sorry, chewy on the bales, mate. Yeah. It, well, the one we, we could go over again was the, the no ball issue in uh, Hobart when Carey survived. Uh, what seemed to be evidently uh, on the replay is a no ball. But Simon, you saw it otherwise at the time? Well, I think the point to be made here is that um, the ICC regulations are different to the laws of cricket. The laws of cricket say that the umpire has to be satisfied that it's a fair delivery. Um, in the ICC playing conditions, um, they're looking to give benefit of doubt to the bowler. If it's inconclusive, the benefit of doubt goes to the bowler. Um, now that we've got automatic no ball technology, and this is maybe something for Claire and Rod to take back to the ICC, you know, should they revert back to basically like a run out that, you know, benefit of doubt goes to the batsman if, you know, yeah. if there's, if, if that's the way the, it is. The um, one, the one, the one, the footage there that Paul saw that, that I think, made him make that decision was the stump cam. And if you look at the stump cam on that particular ball, there's clearly um, the line. You can see the white line behind the boot. Um, now that is, um, what do you call it? Is that one dimensional, two dimensional or whatever it is? The angle of that is suggesting there's um, no part of the, the foot behind the line. Um, now, I, I haven't looked at it um, any other way apart from on the big screen when I was on the ground. I know it was very tight, uh, but I think that's, that's what made him make that call, rightly or wrongly. And it was interesting to look at. Yes. Um, now, um, how are we going for, for time here, Matt? Yeah, we've got 17 minutes uh, and a bunch of questions. So you go, you go as long okay. as you'd like to. No, no. Well, there's a lot of people out there. I would imagine there's a few good questions, so perhaps we should let the audience have a have a crack. Sure. What, well, what we let's uh, let's start with Kanan, and I'll just ask the question, and and Claire, Simon, Rod, sort of just jump in, whoever whoever feels strongest to have an answer straight away, rather than dictating and directing it around. Um, do you think the in the, in the 2019 World Cup? Uh, would there have been any team apart from New Zealand that would have been able to take on their chin a restart of the game without creating a ruckus? And was Kumar Dharamasena right there giving it as five runs on the overthrow uh, of Stokesy off the bat? And that's from Kanan. I suppose I should answer seeing as I was there. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, um, I think uh, Owen Morgan... Uh, an Owen Morgan-led English team, a Joe Root-led English team and a Paddy Cummins-led Australian team would react very similarly nowadays. Mm. Um, having said that, Kane is an absolute gentleman and uh, credit to the way they did react. Uh, incredible group of men to be able to um, hold it together in yep. such a pressured situation. Um the five runs situation was uh, we did not get footage of whether the ball was released 
by the fielder before the batsman had crossed yeah. for the second run. Um, I was I was TV umpire. I was trying to get footage, couldn't get it. We all thought that the fieldsman was closer into the um, to the circle than he actually was once we eventually saw it. And therefore, we thought he must have released it after they'd crossed because it hit Ben Stokes' bat when he was basically in his crease. So knowing what we know now, we know they probably were nowhere near crossing. But at that time, that was the decision that was made, which made the five runs correct. Jim, the disappointing thing about that whole match is that that's what people are going to remember from that wonderful game of cricket, you know, where we had two ties, where we had so many other close moments, you know, whether that's a tight LB on, on one of the New Zealand batsmen or a boundary six that, you know, might have been a catch but it wasn't and all that sort of stuff, is that it was a tremendous game of cricket that ended up in two ties um, and going to a super over. And you raised the point about uh, the question, or the question, person who asked the question raises the point around, you know, the sportsmanship that was on display. And, and I think that's what makes our, our game so great is that, you know, there are individuals and teams who can rise above those sorts of challenges of wanting to win. And, and when you get that wonderful match at the home of cricket at Lords. And you know, Rod, lucky enough to be part of that um, that event as well. And Claire's done some ICC um, events as well. You really, you really take some special, cherished moments from it. It's just disappointing that that match is going to be remembered for one incident that, like every other ball, had an effect on the game. Yeah. Um, okay, let's keep moving it along. Um, this one for each of you to answer uh, at your at uh, your memory. Question for all the umpires. What was the worst howler of a decision you've given and does that player still raise it with you? Oh, God. I have 13 minutes left, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to tee off on this one? Ladies first. <laughs> Claire? I, I can't think of one decision, but I can think of several uh, caught down the leg side that I've evidently got wrong uh, over the years. Uh, so it's... Yeah, it's not one decision, but it's definitely legs, leg side catches that um, are hard for me. Um, and I think a lot of umpires as well. Yeah. Simon? Uh, look, like most umpires, you remember all your bad ones and you remember all your mistakes. And because we've been around a while, I've got a fairly long memory. But uh, I bumped into Darren Ganga uh, at the CPL a couple of years ago and he reminded me of an LBW inside edge that I gave him out at the SCG on. Um, and we reminisced about that over breakfast. Um, but it's, it's interesting. It, it's funny, Matt, the, the players tend to move on in general faster than we do. Yeah, umpires, we tend to hang on to our mistakes a lot longer. Um, but there are some players out there that yeah, just don't get rid of that chip on their shoulder, but most of them move on faster. Yep. Right. Uh, um, I've probably oh, got sorry, three, three, this one three in one ball. Thinking. Now you go, Claire. I was trying to give you more thinking time, Rod, because uh, in the chat, uh, James has nicely reminded me of uh, an LB, a couple of LBW decisions in the India Test match uh, before Christmas. So thanks, James. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they definitely, uh, yeah, no, no, don't worry, mate. It's all good. Um, it was, uh, yeah, a couple of decisions there that uh, I had to process and, and get over um, before very quickly. Uh, one of them, I think I would make, tomorrow because I just didn't see Meg's inside edge uh, onto the pads. And I think that's probably a very good example of uh, DRS being used uh, well, if, if it was available in, the, in that test match. And then the other one, um, I just ignored the red flags of a, a right arm over bowling to a left-hand batter and missed that it pitched outside leg. Um, so if I could have one again, I would definitely change, change my decision there. That's Sorry, very right. cathartic. <laughs> So well, just on that score of umpiring decisions, is there an umpiring decision uh, that um, determined the course of a test match, which had it been changed, uh, may have wrecked the whole of Ashes history since 2005. And Michael Kasparovich has never, as to my knowledge, griped about being given out court with his hand off the bat down the leg side at Edgbiston. And, and, you know, that result stands, obviously, but it was 
one of the most extraordinary results. And it ended up being the trigger for what was one of the best Ashes series uh, we have seen with, with England, of course, winning. Mm. So sometimes these mistakes are worth having. Yeah. Um, uh, Rod, you don't think you're getting away with it, mate. <laughs> no, no, this, this is... Um, I've, I've told this story to a few umpire colleagues. Um, I was doing the IPL at Delhi and Raul Dravid was batting and um, Irfan Patan was bowling, left arm bowler. And it's the ball before the strategic timeout. So he's bowled across him. Raul Dravid's hit the ground, big appeal. And of course, in IPL games, the crowd is very noisy, so you can't hear much, as you all know. Mm. I've, I've gone, no, not out. Raul Dravid started walking towards cover for some unknown reason in a few people's eyes. And I'm standing there watching me start to walk towards the dressing room, which mm. is towards cover. And then, so Irfan Patan's turned around and said, but Rod, he's walking. And I've gone, geez, he is, you're right, Irfan, he's walking. So I've started giving him that one. No, Raul, you're out. And Raul Dravis turned around and going, but Rod, it's drinks. <laughs> I wanted to get a drink. And I've gone, oh, you're right, Raul. Okay, you're not out. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, and as Greg says, well done to all for Very answering good. it honestly and with humour. Um, okay, next question. Uh, this one from Steve. And again, to, to all of you, is there a play that you've umpired that uh, has blown you away? Uh, I presume they either mean like skill, speed, turning the ball, like just umpiring on the field, be it a Warney, I guess, a, um, a Shahid Afridi with the bat, a uh, Brett Lee, the player that blows you away, I presume is what they mean. Simon, you look like you're thinking the hardest. Yeah, um, no, look, uh, I, I, I came across a young Virat Kohli uh, many years ago in a Hobart one day against Sri Lanka. And I think he scored 130 something and he just middled every ball. And uh, I, I could see at that early stage that he certainly was a talent. Um, so his, his batting competency really uh, blew me away. Um, a bowler that stands out, you, you can talk about many bowlers, but uh, Miral Litherin could turn the ball on glass. You know, he was just, he was just a freak in that way. Um, but very fortunate to watch a lot of great players at close quarters, everyone from McGrath and Warren, you know, right through to a, a, a Tendulkar. Uh, Rod's mentioned a Dravid, um, certainly most stoic, but one of the most talented people that I've seen in my time is an AB de Villiers. Just so talented in anything that he put his hand to, like keeping, um, bowling, batting, fielding, uh, for me was just the all-round athlete. So I don't think he gets enough credit, AB de Villiers, as being an absolute wonderful cricketer. Yeah. yeah. Clear or Rod? I can't think of, a, player, of, one, of, of one player, but what I think has been really exciting is over the last three or four years with the increased training and professionalism in the women's game uh, and seeing that, in, that improve. I think that's really exciting to see what will happen over the next few years. Yeah. Uh, Rod? I would find it really hard to just nominate a player or, you know, um, over the, the amount of years I've been involved in cricket and played and an umpire, there's so many that just can blow you away at certain times. And, you know, and the names you'd come out with would just be like a who's who of cricket. Your Viv Richards, as you, you know, I played with Ricky Ponting when he first started playing first class cricket. He was incredible. Um, you know, Simon mentions AB de Villiers, um, you know, Sachin, Kumar, Sangakara, I saw him get a double hundred, Callis, right. a double hundred. Dale Stain bowling at 150 odd clicks. It's just you could just keep going, um, and and they're all incredible in their own way. And it's one of the great things that we get to to see from close up. Yeah, and you know it's still going on now. Still, so many great players around the, in the game now. Um, a, a personal one: Has any player ever intimidated you, or you've just found very uncomfortable to have to umpire? <laughs> Yeah, them bowling or batting? Um, that's a hard question. Intimidated. 
Um, you usually get more intimidated by the fact that you've made a decision that you're not comfortable with or you think's incorrect or so you lose a bit of confidence in a short period of time. Um, a player, um, Graham Smith was a, a, a quite an intimidating um, person being such a big guy and, and he always asked you difficult questions. You never got away with anything, any sort of answer. I can, I can normally bluff my way through an answer by being a, you know, either quick-witted or a, you know, streetwise answer. But with Graham, it was always, um, you know, the South African sense of humour came out. <laughs> Simon, do you? Yeah, I'll give you a quick one. Um, a lot of spin bowlers are probably uh, more challenging to umpire because you're always in the game uh, and. Um, spin bowlers um, are very interesting people by nature anyway, but uh, Stuart McGill comes to mind because he was doing a, a game at the SCG one day and, and Brett Lee misfielded a ball off McGill, goes to the boundary for four and, and Stewie just tears strip off, off, just basically went to town on Brett Lee and called him every name under the sun. And of course, everything was out when Stuart bowled. So I gave him a couple of not outs to appeal and I looked across at Steve War at uh, fielding mid-wicket. I said to Steve, I said, mate, is he your problem today or is he mine? And as quick as I asked the question, he went back at me and he said, mate, he's all yours. I've got nothing to do with him. Um, so I always found umpiring Stuart uh, quite challenging. Yeah. Um, uh, whilst we're with you, Simon, a question from Rohit. Did you have mixed emotions when Australia got knocked out of the 2011 quarter final, which meant you could officiate the finals for the first time? Uh, do you have those sorts of emotions or was it all just about your role? Uh, it's a good question. I always loved it and I still do today. I like to see Australia lose when they play cricket. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it is a funny thing that we do because uh, as Claire and, and Rod might, might appreciate, you know, when your home country doesn't do well in, in a tournament, you get that opportunity if you're good enough and if selected, two big ifs to perhaps go further. But I always saw the benefit in both scenarios, Matt, that if Australia won, I get to go home early. And if Australia lost, I might hang around and maybe get an, an extra match fee. But yeah. was, I looked at it as a win-win, didn't matter. Yeah. Um, uh, Rod, is the, especially because you've been up close and personal with them, a question from Mark, of the current Australian 11, is there anyone who you could see moving into umpiring? Um. Wow, current Australian, no, not, no, I haven't. They probably, well, Nathan Lyon thinks he's a good umpire. <laughs> <laughs> In actual fact, he is quite good from square leg at predicting heights. He's done some homework on that. Um, mm. And he, we do have some good banter out there. He's, he's, he's good to, um, you know, have a chat with out there. Um, there is talk that there's a couple of, I think Joe Many, who used to play for South Australia, is, mm -hmm. is currently umpiring. Um, unfortunately, I think the Cricket Australia are not doing the project panel anymore, which is what um, Claire's been involved with, mm -hmm. Paul Rifle, myself, Paul Wilson, Sean Craig involved with. Um, you know, we'd love to see them encourage former players to get involved, not not just for the um, for the players to get uh, a, a job after cricket, but also it's great to have former players involved with people who are umpiring who haven't played as much. It's just a good mix. Yeah. Um, now, we'll try to rock it through because I know we hit time. Just for the record, we're still 350 for the ball from Duncan, 200 for the wines for Mark. Um, there's a lot of questions about DRS, which we've largely tried to touch on, but we'll try to hit on as many topics quickly because uh, I know you guys have been very generous with your time. Um, uh, regarding... Uh, bad light, stopping play and getting back onto the field. So much time was lost during the Ashes series. This is a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, can we do more to get the game going? Simon, the smile on your face as you can start with this one. No, I didn't give it to Rod. I think Rod was there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I heard that Michael Vaughan suggested that we um, use a pink ball when it got dark uh, in Test cricket. And Vaughan, he said we should use a pink ball when it got too dark. We'd go then next morning, change it back to the red ball. Mm. Well, the integrity of test cricket oh. is that you don't change the ball. You, you know, you, you, 
your bowlers hit it on the seam so that it keeps one side shiny, etc., or whatever. Um, look, we we have been encouraged for the last probably five to ten years in international cricket to to try and play longer, and we certainly do play longer now than we used to in light. Um, you know, what happens is the TV coverage does make the light look better than it actually is. Mm. So, um, you know, we, we do play until it gets quite dark. And, um, you know, it, it, it's got to be fair to the players as well. You know, it, it, I know the laws don't say that, but it, it's it's got to be reasonable for the players to, um, to be able to uh, manage facing guys buying 145k an hour. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, Claire, you can answer this one because it's general and uh, this is all a matter of opinion. Uh, did you think that the, and this is uh, Rohit, the, uh, the, Virat, the India South Africa decision, the one that got Virat Kohli and whatnot so angry at the stumps, did you think uh, that looked like it was going over or would you have given it out as it appeared? <laughs> yeah. Really not going to like my answer, but I actually haven't seen the footage for what? it. What? So How? I haven't watched it. I'm sorry. Simon can... Simon? <laughs> it's going over. Um, I was generally surprised uh, at that particular ball tracking, but I can I can sort of sympathise with Murray and sympathise with the panel because I gave a similar one off Suleiman Ben in the West Indies on Jacques Callis that I gave out for exactly the same reasons and the ball predictive pass showed it going over the top. What we are finding, of course, is that we get presented with new information because of ball tracking and, and DRS in every match. You know, information that we haven't seen before. Um, but predictive path is just that. It's predictive, yeah. you know. And uh, if there wasn't predictive path, we'd be debating the decision. The fact that yeah. there is predictive path, at least it provides some certainty of, of outcome. But... Uh, I do sympathise with the umpire involved. Uh, it's brand new information and you just stand back and you go, wow, well, uh, you know, Rod and I have had some interesting ones, I think, in Sri Lanka regarding height of a couple of spinners as well. And you just think, uh, I must be umpiring a different game sometimes. Yeah. Hey, Jim, was it you, and correct me if I'm wrong, that tweeted that stumps should be made an inch higher because they've never been looked at, but people are taller and pitches are bouncier? And Yeah, I made this observation a few times over the years. The size of the stumps has only changed once since we started Test Cricket. That was in 1931. Um, and it was slightly increased and slightly widened. That's why if you look at those old stumps uh, that Brabin used, they're much thinner, right, than the ones we use today. My opinion is that because we've got you know, better athletes and all sorts of changing conditions, yes, the stumps should go up another inch and probably go out another half inch. Uh, but, Jesus, there will be a lot of batsmen who are involved in the rules of the game will be protesting about that. But um, I think there's, look, it hasn't happened for 90 years. And when it did happen in 1929, 30, Australia refused to play under the changing rule for the 1932 of Britain. So Bradman defended a set of old stumps when he made 974. And then the next year, they changed the size of the stumps. It's a little known bit of history about the game, but um, maybe it's time 90 years on that we increase the size of the stumps. Of that matter. Drop me an email, Jim. I'll take it to the laws committee. <laughs> okay. Jim, right. just, a, just a problem <laughs> with that is that um, one of my colleagues in New Zealand, Chris Gaffney, would probably struggle to see over them if he... Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> I hope he's online listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good when you drop a good sledge. You just hope that they're there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's so many things about this game. Can I ask these guys a question now? Please do, Jim. Go to the next one right out. Okay. Uh, one of the, 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 the laws of cricket that defies common sense is one short. Surely, if you run down there and you're not, you're not out in your ground and you run back, that's too short, not one short. Why isn't it too short? Because of the way the law is defined. Why? It's not too short. Because you can only have a short run and turning for a further run. If you, can't, if you haven't made your ground, you're short of your ground for that run. And then running back, you're still short because you left your left foot before you, you moored the boat. So, so Jim, Jim, the mistake you're making is that you're trying to make sense out of cricket laws. 
<laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Here's Thank your you. first mistake. <laughs> so, Jen, Jim, you'd like every batsman to stay within their ground before they take their first run? They can't start their first run standing outside their crease? Well, if the bowler knocks the bales off and he's not in his ground, you'll give him out, won't you? Well, I'm just asking. You haven't answered my question. So yeah, you, well, so strike you, is if, in. If, if we're going to use technology, we'll start replaying those on every run that's taken. Has he left before he should have? Yes. Don't send me that email thanks, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, all right. Uh, I'm just trying to find ones that connect the answer quickly. Um, oh, dear. One question was from uh, from Gauss, I believe you pronounce it. Um, what is Alim Dar like as a person? Obviously, would like to know um, as, as a fellow. What's Alim like? Lovely man. Yeah. yeah a, great, a great, lovely man, salt of the earth. Uh, obviously, very religious, but a great person of integrity, like really easy to work with, um, gentle soul and um, very honest and, yeah. Great. Um, from Greg, uh, do any of you have an umpiring superstition? <laughs> Out of time. Claire? <laughs> uh, I've got lucky undies. Really? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, what in? Jonathan Agnew. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I was definitely not putting them up for our option. Um, <laughs> very much still in use. <laughs> But, yep, no, definitely Lucky Undies on, lucky on every undies. game. <laughs> come, on. come on, boys, come on. you got to keep up with that. What have you got? Oh, I don't uh, wear any. <laughs> don't wear them, right. <laughs> um, uh, a question from Dean. Do ex-cricketers make better umpires or not? Mm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in perspective. Uh, and, uh, you know, like... Simon's, we've all played, a lot of us played different levels. Umpiring with Ravi from uh, India, who was on the elite panel for a, quite, some, quite some time. And Ravi used to say to me and to my colleagues, it was easier for us to umpire than it was for him. Because it was for us, it was like walking into an office, our own office. For him, it was like walking into a, a different part of life well, he had to learn noises and sounds that we would have grown up with hearing all the way along now that was just his perspective on it you, um, you don't have to be a horse to be a horse trainer yeah yeah absolutely um, uh, I'll, we, are, we are absolutely over time so um, last two questions because I quite like these two um, from uh, from Rohit, who decides who's going to officiate the first over? Uh, the bowling team. <laughs> <laughs> so we, do toss, we do toss the reins. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lee, you, want to, you want to tell them how yeah. we toss the reins? I was, yeah, Lee, it's, it's, we leave it up to the cricket gods. Um, and so the bale, obviously, the spigot has got one short end and one tall end. And so the, the taller umpire is the tall spigot and the shorter umpire is the other end. And the bale gets tossed into the air. And then whichever way the bale lands, that is the end that is yours. So if, if you, if you're, you'd have to be at the ground um, probably about, what, an hour before the game started to, to see this happen. But... I'm pretty sure 95% of games, you'll, you'll see it happen uh, on the field of play. That's Unless you're on fire with Ben Cat, he tells you which end you're going to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and last question for all. Um, who, according to you, is the ghost of all umpires? Ghost. Ghost. The goat. The greatest goat. of all time. Of goat. The goat. Oh, well, that's... A, that's uh... You're allowed to say yourself, Simon. No, no, not at all. I'm, I'm, I look, generally, when I came through the system, it's a long answer, which you don't want to hear, but I looked at all the best qualities in the umpires that I'd worked with, you know, Daryl Hare, Dave Shepard, Rudy Kutzen, uh, even Davis, Gould, you, you know, it, all of those guys. And I said, I don't want to be like one of them. I wanted to just take their best attribute and see if I could apply that to me. So, you know, yeah, I, I, I couldn't pick one. It's just hard too hard. Did you then stand there and practice your dismissal in the mirror? Bullshit. No. There's, I don't believe that. No, no not at all. Not at Ever? all. Ever? No. Rod? 
Um, I'll answer it in two ways. Uh, the gentleman who we're doing this broadcast with, uh, with all the memorabilia behind him, uh, certainly did more for umpiring than I think any other umpire in the history of cricket. Uh, to make it worthwhile to do and to uh, change the professionalism of it. Um, and, you know, it, it, certainly every umpire in the world looks up to him in a lot of ways. Um, having said that, as Simon knows, I couldn't umpire like he did, does and goes through the, the, a lot of processes like he did. Um, the person I looked up to, uh, even though I never umpired, was David Shepherd. I wanted to be more like David Shepherd, who was um, looked relaxed and had a rapport with players. And I, I probably naturally um, was more like him than uh, than I would have been. Well, I mean, I think I wrote a report on Simon in one of his first Sheffield Shield games. Uh, <laughs> is that correct, Simon? Probably. <laughs> Was a very very poor column, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. So David Shepherd in uh, in, a lot, in mannerisms and rapport with players, but certainly no one else has ever done as much for umpiring as uh, Simon has. Yeah, nice answer. And Claire. Yeah, I don't think I can top those two answers. Sorry, Matt. Yeah, no, they are good answers, and they're they're good answers to end on. Um, let's close the bidding uh, as we have. Uh, made great money here today. Uh, Duncan with the ball, Simon 350, 400 for Claire's shirt, and Mark with the wines, $200. So that's great money uh, being raised for the primary club. And Jim, during this conversation, as has been pointed out in the conversation, and certainly pertinent to the goals of everything that the primary club is about, um, Dylan Alcott has been named the 2022 Australian of the Year, a superb ambassador for... Has Disabled he Africa. really? Yeah. That's big news because he was yeah. down playing it so much this afternoon after he won his match to go into the final down in Melbourne. So fantastic. That That is a... That is a a primary club award of some significance, that one. Yeah, no, that is sensational. Hey, Simon, Rod and Claire, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, no, that's great. There, thank I, you for I met, coming on board. Yeah, yeah, there were many more questions um, to get to, so we will probably throw the invite to you next year when we do this again. Uh, this is the last one. A big thank you again to our sponsors, Vocus. Ponting Wines, the EQ, um, as we have mentioned, this has already exceeded the results from last year. Uh, stay tuned for more information about what we'll be doing next year and all the forthcoming events. But uh, Mr. Maxwell, it's been a pleasure this series as always. Matt, thank you very much for your guidance and uh, raising so much useful money. To Rod and to Simon and Claire, thank you for participating. It's been sure. good. And uh, Thanks, we've saved plenty of questions for next time. So. Yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot. Uh, <laughs> thank you, guys. Have a really thank wonderful you. evening. Good luck with the test, Claire. Yeah. Yeah, no good luck, you. Take that tree down, Jim. Cheers. 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 See you, guys. Bye. Closing off or just chatting away again? What's up? We'll see you later, Jim. Thank you. Bye, Claire. Bye. Thank you. Bye, <laughs> Jeff. Next four days <clears throat> without an umbrella. <laughs> well, um, yeah. Well, um, thanks thank a lot. Thank you.